with me today. We're going to continue our study in the book of Romans. And if you've been tracking with this, we started this just sort of a little, uh, you know, outtake of Romans. We started in chapter five, where we're much more then affected by what Jesus did than what Adam did. Then in chapter six, if you'll remember, Paul goes to great lengths to assure us that our old nature is dead, died with Christ, and when he was resurrected, our old nature was not. We were, in fact, resurrected with him, but our old nature wasn't. So he really brought that home. And then the first part of chapter seven in our last session, he assures us through his his, uh, teaching there that we are freed from sin. And he uses the analogy of a, of a woman married to a husband who dies and then she's no longer bound to the law. So today we're going to pick it up there and we're going to work through uh, the rest of chapter seven today. And then we'll be positioned to get into chapter eight. And then I think we'll probably do some other things. But I just wanted you to sort of get this, this, this centerpiece of the book of Romans, if you will, and how important it really is to the theology of not only the rest of that book, but to our lives uh, in a very powerful Way. So let me just uh, give you a couple of quotes here. This is from Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, and he's a great preacher and, and uh, commentator and, and um, you know theologian. One of my favorites, actually. And he says this about the book of Romans. He says that the epistle to the Romans has possibly played a more important and more crucial part in the history of the church than any other single book in the whole of the Bible. I would I would expect that that's uh, true. I both certainly believe that. So Augustine is somebody perhaps you're familiar with. He's looked at as the most perhaps uh, impactful figure on the church from the canon of scripture to the Reformation. And he was saved by simply reading Romans chapter 13. And once that happened, he left philosophy as a vocation and became uh, the church's most renowned theologian. So the book, to say the book of Romans has had a profound effect on believers and high profile believers over the centuries would be putting it mildly. So as we get into this study, just remember that God has some things to say to us, particularly about our relationship to the law and sin as we'll continue in this discussion today. I'm not going to read verses 7 through 12, but let me just sort of, you know, point out something here is that Paul is pointing out that the law is holy. And even though the law is holy, it wasn't um, able to make us holy, if you will. So the law requires and demands righteousness, but it cannot impart righteousness. So the law demands righteousness, but what Paul is getting at here is that grace provides righteousness. So I'm not going to take our time to, to read through those verses. As you do that, then you can, you can draw those conclusions. But let's begin in verse 13 of Romans 7. And I'll just, uh, if you have your Bible, I'm reading out of the New King James. It says, has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might be exceedingly sinful. So really what he's getting at here is the heart of the purpose of the law. And the purpose of the law, of course, is holy, it's perfect, it's righteous, but again, had no power to make us that way. So what it, in fact, did is it convicted us. It indicted us of sin, all humanity, old covenant, new covenant. It is a standard that no one could could achieve except Jesus. So, you know, if you've ever heard people say, well, you know, the new, the, the, Jesus, you know, is how we get saved by grace, but the Ten Commandments tells us how we should live. Well, not exactly. The Ten Commandments was there to show you how you could not live. And now in Christ, by faith, then we are free from that law, and we are, and we'll see this, you know, when we get into the beginning of chapter eight, and we'll do that today before we're finished, that we are now uh, under a different law, the law of life. And so that, that's essentially what he's getting at there. Now let's go through the rest of this chapter. In Romans 7, verse 14, and I'm going to go down to verse 22. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. 
If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I want you to think about what he just said there, that sin dwells in him in this, in this example. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. There's that idea again. I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Now, this is a very interesting portion of this chapter. Uh, It's something that is highly debated. And there are three prevailing uh, opinions about this particular group of verses. And I have my opinion, and and you may have a different one, and that's okay. Uh, There are a lot of significant, notable leaders in the body of Christ, theologians, uh, you know, teachers, you name it. I mean, authors that love the Lord, they're born again, and they have differing opinions here. And uh, so let's just talk about these for a moment. The three popular ideas that, that, that is happening in these verses that, number one, Paul is talking about himself before he is born again. So we're seeing him kind of flash back here in the midst of chapter five, chapter six, we get into this middle part of chapter seven, and it would appear that he's, uh, to some, that he's flashing back a little bit and explaining what it was like to be a non-Christian, you know, with sin dwelling in him and so forth. That happens to be my opinion. Uh, The second idea here is that he's a Christian, and of course, that one's easy to, to believe because we feel this way. We, we have this sensation that, that we sin, we don't want to do it, we're irritated that we do it. So we can, we can identify with this, but some of the terminology here is difficult for me if he's a believer, how sin would dwell in him. Uh, and so again, we don't, we don't want to discount the, the verses that are clear in Scripture for the, for the ones that are a bit obscure. And I'm not saying that that's happening here. I'm just saying that people are having a differing of opinion. Here's another popular opinion here, and that would be that he is speaking of himself as a young Christian, a Christian who is still yet immature in his thinking. And so he's got this struggle going on. And of course, this is where some of what I consider a goofy theological position that we wake up every day and we battle our flesh. We battle the old nature. We battle, you know, this, this uh, nature that's around us. And of course, we're in this world. We're not of it. But, but we wake up and we have this idea that, man, we're just fighting sin all day long. And I don't believe that that's what he's getting at here. Um, but at, at any rate, those are the three prevailing opinions about that particular verse. Now, uh, here's why I believe he's talking about himself before he has he was born again, okay? Number one, there, there's no mention that he makes of the Spirit's power. And I think in Paul's writing, that would be odd that he wouldn't uh, bring the power of the Holy Spirit in. So perhaps this is uh, him talking about himself before he was a believer. Uh, the second thing is that Romans 7.14 says, I am carnal, sold under sin. Okay, Uh, I just read that to you. And then in Romans 6.7, though, he says we are freed from sin. So if both of those things are true, if he's a believer in both of those instances, then those two verses, Romans 7.14 and Romans 6.7, would be a contradiction. And then, of course, in uh, Romans 7.23, which we'll read in a moment, it says that he's in captivity to sin. But as we get to Romans 8.2, which we'll do that in a moment as well, he says we are free from the law of sin and death. So again, they seem to be uh, mutually exclusive. In other words, if both of them are true, there's a conflict there's some kind of a, a, a rub here between these. And again, I think the reason why a lot of believers assume that, and, and, and I've heard people use this as an excuse 
uh, why they struggle with sin is because, well, you know, uh, Paul did it too. You know, the things that he didn't want to do, he did, and the things that he wanted to do, you know, whatever. And so we understand. And, and I think that it could be, I think the important thing perhaps is not to try to really nail down the perspective Paul is coming from, uh, but to understand, again, the truth of the Scripture, that we are free from sin. We're no longer under this law. We're no longer under, uh, you know, the, the conviction of trying to perform the law, and now we're in this place of grace. And so I think, uh, I think my opinion and my view on this, to me, is more consistent throughout all the other verses when you consider those, because we, we are born again, and we're on a on a progression, of course. So, I mean, I see where people could get that, but I believe he's talking about a time before he was born again. Because even if you're immature, even if you're just brand new, a brand new Christian, I don't see how sin still dwells in you. Uh, so that would be my my take on that. Okay. I think as important as it is what Paul is saying in these passages, I think it's important to note what he is not saying. And here again, I want to hammer this home because this is something, in my opinion, that trips people up. And that is this. He is not saying that we have two competing natures within us, that we have the sin nature and we have the God nature and you know, those two battle it out every day. He's not saying that at all. In fact, in, in chapter six, he was very clear and very plain about making us understand in, in, open, in, in open language that we are not bound to that old nature any longer, okay? So now, let's uh, let's continue. Let's go to verse number 23. And he says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members or in my body. So again, this is one of those more difficult uh, aspects of this passage. So let me ask you a question. Can a Christian be addicted can a Christian commit suicide? And you say, well, you know, maybe you've heard, like many of us did, that if a person, if a Christian commits suicide, then they go to hell because the last thing they did on earth was commit murder, essentially. But let me ask you another question. Do Christians die of diseases and sicknesses? Um, do Christians die of cancer on occasion, you know? Um, the answer is yes. So if a person dies of cancer and they go to heaven if they're a Christian. What if somebody dies of suicide as a result of mental illness of some kind, and, you know, then they go to hell? Well, I don't think so. I think that we, we have this convoluted way of looking at certain things, and so I think that when you, when you consider those things in light of these verses, I think that there is some obviously there's an issue with the devil and the lies of the enemy and the power of of wickedness that doesn't necessarily mean that when we're born again we have sin you know dwelling in us or that we come in captivity to sin but it can certainly feel that way remember this verse from from Romans 6 and verse 18 it says and having been set free from sin you became slaves of righteousness and uh, and and that that word slave there is is this idea of of you know being a voluntary servant. In fact, that word there, uh, uh, dulo, is to make one subservient to one's interests, to cause to be like a slave. So it doesn't necessarily mean that he's saying that that he doesn't have any free will in this idea, but but that that he's wanting to walk with the one that set him free. If you are a slave, if you're in prison, if you had been locked away for life and somebody came along and set you free, it's likely that you would want to get to know that person, to, to walk with that person, to understand that person's heart. And I think that's the picture we get in Romans 6, 18. But watch this now. Just two verses upstream in Romans 6, 16, it says, Do you not know to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Now, think of it this way. If I could convince you that it was your job 
and your responsibility to come to my house every Saturday and wash my vehicles, and you believed it, well, then your job every Saturday would be to come to my house and to wash my vehicles. Whom you yield yourself a servant to obey, you're that person's servant you are to whom you obey. So I think that a Christian could get themselves into a situation where they could be addicted. I think a Christian could get us into a situation over a period of time now that they would uh, get themselves to a situation where they, they would end up committing suicide. I have a friend that did that not too long ago. Does that mean they go to hell? Absolutely not. It means that, that they leave early and they, you know, do something, you know, as they say, it's a, it's a permanent solution to a, a temporary problem, but it does happen. And so I think, in, in the scope of this passage, what I'm trying to say here is even though we're born again, even though we're free from sin, even though we have authority over these things, if we're not renewing our mind to who we are in Christ daily, well, then what happens is we are uh, easy pickings then. And it's not, and it's not because there's sin dwelling in us. It's because the devil is a liar. You know, David faced Goliath and successfully so because his mind was renewed to the faithfulness of God. He just kept talking about God. No, everybody else couldn't stop talking about Goliath. David couldn't stop talking about God. But then he got himself in trouble years later when it was time for kings to go out to war, he stayed back. And he wasn't, you know, paying attention and he got himself in a situation why? Because he stopped renewing his mind to the goodness of God. It can happen. It happened to David. He was He's the apple of God's eye, the Bible says, and he got himself in that situation. Now, you and I are new covenant believers, so that's a whole nother situation. But friend, we've seen it where people fail to renew their mind to who they are in Christ, to the goodness of God, to the grace of God, and then the devil comes along and preys on these feelings that we have when we're in the midst of a struggle like Paul points out here in Romans 7, which I believe, again, is not him as a believer being pressured, but him as an unbeliever. But whichever way it may go, I could be wrong. Let's just say he's a believer. He's struggling with keeping his mind focused. Well, then he's he's in the midst of that fight. And if we refuse to bring ourselves back to center and allow our spirit to lead our emotions and to, you know, understand who we are in Christ and and stand on that, articulate that even to the to the heavens, whatever what however you have to do that to get yourself adjusted, then that's what you have to do. Amen. Let's move on here to verse number uh, verse number 24. It says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So again, here he is talking about, you know, all these uh, phrases that to me don't resonate with a person that's born again. Verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, I have to admit that these are, these are difficult scriptures to think that, that he's not saved because now, you know, he's coming back around and saying, you know, I thank God. And then he's saying that, you know, he serves the Lord with his mind, but it, with his flesh, sin. So is he just trying to focus in on this issue that we do have in this fallen world of dealing with these things? Whichever way it goes, again, like I said earlier, we don't throw out clear scriptures in favor of obscure scriptures, okay? Because he's about to shift gears and make it very, very clear who we are in Christ. 